So, uh, good afternoon and welcome to the third talk in our series of popular level talks from RRI, uh, Vigyana Kathagalu. Um, and we are privileged to have Professor Rohini Godbole for our uh, uh, the third talk in this series. Uh, she is a distinguished scientist, physicist, who doesn't need much introduction, but for the sake of um, protocol and for the new students. Uh, she is currently uh, the uh, honorary professor in the Center for High Energy Physics in IASC. Um, she did her undergraduate from uh, degree from University of Pune and then from IIT Mumbai masters and then she did her PhD in particle physics from Stony Brook, uh, sunny uh, Stony Brook, USA. And uh, after that, she joined uh, TAFR Mumbai as a fellow and she was also a lecturer in the University of Mumbai. Uh, after which she joined ISC and where she has worked for many decades and then she finally retired in 2018 and she's now an honorary professor in CHEP. Uh, she has worked uh, extensively in various topics of particle physics and uh, has been recognized and appreciated for her research work by various awards, including Padma Shri from the Government of India, um, also an award from the Government of France. I think I don't know how to pronounce that. Probably roughly translates as a National Order of Merit or something like that. Um, besides her research work, she also um, is uh, uh, actively interested in participates in science popularization and gives talks, which and which is why we are privileged to have her today. And besides that, she has also been championing the uh, participation of women in uh, science and uh, has been the founding chair of uh, um, academy panel on women in science. So without further ado, uh, let me welcome Professor Gudbole. And, uh, and she's going to talk on uh, Steven Weinberg and his physics. So thank you very much for this very kind introduction. As I was telling him that here, in this institute, there are a lot of friends. But I guess it's what is correct is that all those people in the back row, they wouldn't know. So some amount of introduction was necessary. It's a pleasure to be back here in RRI and talk. I always enjoy giving talks here. And uh, today, uh, when initially Tarun asked me to talk, first I was thinking about talking about dark matter because that's what right now I am, for the last two, three years, I've been working on. And of course, the particle physics aspects of it. But then I thought that in this institute, uh, there are people who know much more about astrophysics, astronomy, and dark matter than I ever will know. So I decided that I will not talk about this, but uh, I will uh, instead share, and particularly keeping in mind uh, the students in the audience, I decided that uh, I will share some thoughts on the, as the title says, on uh, the life and the physics of Steven Weinberg, because I think to me, his life and his physics sort of ep epitomizes what is research in theoretical discipline like and you know how can one and actually it's one of the rare examples because what has happened is that I think we were spoiled in the uh, 20th century with the discovery of towering ideas like quantum mechanics, general theory of relativity, so on and so forth. So. We only knew, you know, in popular names, we know are all really the big names of Schrodinger or Einstein. And then people who came from, you know, many decades after that actually could add, could sculpt the mod things better. But uh, in some sense, uh, it was not clear what was new. And whereas person like Weinberg, in my mind, he actually and truly through the work that he did kind of once again showed that, that theoretical work 
really and truly is very interdisciplinary and we try to box it into different uh, groups and at the same time the work had extremely high relevance in the so to say the narrow field of theoretical particle physics. So I think it is a very rare combination uh, that we have from and this is to therefore to me and my feeling he is really one of the towering theoretical physicists of uh, 20th century physics after the, 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 the big names that we all uh, know as the founders of quantum physics and what have you. So this is uh, Steven Weinberg, the physicist and his physics. And this is how I think people, people of uh, my generation at least remember him. He, and this is part of the story that I would like to tell you that uh, he was not just a great physicist, but he was also a great teacher. And I would like to uh, kind of, uh, I remember him in this kind of uh, teaching uh, uh, process, uh, this thing all the time. So just to begin with, uh, since it's uh, uh, some of you might have read in the newspapers the last year when he passed away, uh, sometimes some things about him, but otherwise uh, he was in public imagination very long time back first that was in uh, the Nobel Prize which he got in 1979 and this Nobel Prize was given jointly to him and Glashow as well as Abdus Salam and the citation was for their contributions to the theory of the unified weak and electromagnetic interactions between elementary particles. So that was like the 2D force uh, piece of work that, uh, I, uh, that got this Nobel Prize and then including inter alia the prediction of the weak neutral current. So they predicted a new phenomenon as it were and this was the work that was done in 1967 and actually as now we know after 1967 we know that these were the first baby steps towards what we call today the standard model of particle physics which is the, the accepted description of uh, fundamental elementary particles and interactions among them. And the process of establishing what what's called then the model as the theory, this process took place you know, in about 70, 50 to 60 years, even more than that a little bit. And Wein, uh, uh, Steven Weinberg's name or even the standard model of particle physics became well known only after the Higgs boson was discovered, which is also now 10 years ago, and all the hoopla that was associated with this Higgs boson discovery, which was also called the God, God particle and what have you. And that's where one of the times when Steven Weinberg came, or the or his, so one of his uh, creations came to the notice of public per se. But this work that which got him a Nobel Prize is actually a very, I would not say very small part, but a rather small part, I would say, of his legacy for theoretical physics in general and particle physics in particular. So I know it's very rare scientist when you say that his Nobel Prize winning discovery was only a part of his legacy. I mean, that is something that already says a lot about the towering contributions that uh, this person made to science and our way we think about physics. But actually to a lot of common people, Weinberg was known much before all this and that was because of uh, a very wonderful book which he wrote which was called The First Three Minutes and I think uh, for the younger generation perhaps who are brought up uh, uh, with the brief history of time by Stephen Hawking, that I would say that this was the one which caught the imagination of my generation at least and we learned about mere mortals learned about what cosmology can be, at least what is a lay person's understanding that was done by Steven Weinberg in this wonderful book. Actually my personal copy, of course this is taken from the web, but my personal copy has exactly the same cover apart from the fact that it's a bit faded and it's torn because of the continuous reading. But I still, I definitely learned and a lot, pe lot of people like me learned about the beautiful uh, synergy of different branches of uh, science that come together to understand the beginning of the universe and the formation of everything. So 
this is the Steven Weinberg, the physicist. I already made statements, but I want to sort of keep them in front of your eyes. I would really say, I already said this, that he was the most influential theoretical physicist of one of the most influential, influential physicists of the 20th century. And to my mind, and I think to many minds of many, many other physicists, his work and contributions are comparable to people like Rutherford and Bohr, which we even learn in school about, and people like Paul Dirac and Enrico Fermi, whose names we learn only when we learn quantum mechanics in uh, BSc. I would say that the paths in theoretical physics and particularly in theoretical particle physics that he chartered actually became the highways of the in the world for uh, both theoretical physics and particle physics in the last 60 to 70 years. And this is what I mean by saying that ap apart from particle physics, it also had implications in other branches of uh, you know, physics. And I would say that in some sense, I hope that I would be able to convey to you at the end of the talk that unification of interactions, of ideas, of disciplines was something of his passion. And I think in that sense, it goes back to the early days of our scientific developments where we didn't have these boxes. Now, the point is that now we are once again realizing this, that having boxes is no good and we need to do interdisciplinary research. But these are the sort of an example of a real theorist who would uh, look at all the ideas together. So what will I do? I will try to give you a very brief description of his legacy. And there I would go a little bit into technicalities of, at least I will use few technical words, but I won't uh, uh, use uh, too much of uh, technical jargon. And then I would actually also, there is an equally important part. I mean, of course, there is this, you know, everything from unified theory of electromagnetic and weak interaction to the theory of everything that he has contributed almost to the whole vista. So I would try to give you a glimpse of that. But then, as I said, there is an important part of him where I would be failing if I don't talk about it. One is his legacy as a teacher, not just for the university students, but for all of us acting physicists in general. Then equally important are Weinberg's opinions and advice in practice of science and relevance of science to society, place of science in human uh, endeavor. So he has really a lot of very important statements. So Weinberg, the advocate of science, Weinberg, the you know historian of science, there are a lot of different roles. He lived a very rich life of 80, uh, he was, you know, he passed away when he was 88 years old. And in this entire lifespan, he contributed not just to theoretical physics, but to, of course, to teaching and to various other issues, as I have said. So there is a lot more to the man and his science than what I will tell you. And I can uh, sort of guide you to these two obituaries, which I wrote with Urjit Yadnik, where we tried to give a glimpse, a more deeper glimpse of some of his work. So he passed away on 23rd July 2021, and that was at the age of 88, as I already said. At that time, he held this Josie Regental Chair of the University of Texas. And I do again repeat that the world of physics and particularly theoretical physics really mourned his passing away. He was a totally brilliant theoretical physicist, and I think there is hardly an area in the development of particle physics in this uh, period that he did not touch or that he did not contribute in a very fundamental way. I mean, you know, as a particle physicist, you study things and then you come across Weinberg operators, Weinberg conditions, Weinberg's theorems. You know, I mean, you name it and there are things. So it's very, very difficult in particle physics particularly to find anything where he did not contribute in a very, very fundamental way. So, and actually the interesting thing is that he continued doing so till the end because he passed away in 23rd July 2021 and his last latest book, Foundations of Modern Physics, was published in April 2021. So, and in fact, he was uh, supposed to teach a course, I forget, I think either on atomic physics or modern physics in the September uh, uh, semester at uh, University of Texas. So that is really the man for you. And he even uploaded, in case you thought that it was only teaching and the books, 
He uploaded a paper on the high energy physics archives as late as January 1921. So this was an amazing human being, a scientist at that. He was in, you know, he, he had people asked him when was he going to retire, and he said, "I plan to retire shortly after my uh, after I die." And as of his many many predictions, I think this also came to be true. In fact, I remember listening to an online lecture by him in April 2020, which actually right after the the pandemic took over, there was a whole, you know, sort of people started just to keep the enthusiasm of researchers on. People started setting up a whole lot of online meetings, online series of lectures, and a very important series of lectures was started, international lecture program, and he gave the inaugural lecture of that. And I remember listening to his lecture. He finished it in one hour and fifteen minutes, which is what he was supposed to talk about. And then I remember because we started asking questions and the program went longer than he had allotted. He said, to, called his secretary and said, "Tell my students to wait for ten minutes because I have to wrap up this answering the questions." I mean, I, I find this commitment also to teaching as well as the commitment to the lectures is something that we need to remember and understand that one should take. You know, this is for my uh, young and uh, not so young colleagues also that we have to take our teaching very seriously. So, and what is interesting that in this entire talk, which was very complex, but at the, given very lucidly, not once did he look at lecture notes, which were also, they were sitting on the left hand side on his table. We could see that he had them, but in the entire one hour and fifteen minutes lecture, he didn't once look at it. And in fact, my friends who have taken courses with him would say that when he would come to teach. He would just start writing, not get a single factor of i or two pi or root two pi wrong, and most of us keep on getting them wrong royally and then rub them off. But he was absolutely wonderful in many ways, and that was one of the things that at least I found very interesting. So, what was his world life? He was born to immigrant parents in 1933. I guess the year tells you all, and. He was actually the first one from his family to have a college education, and in fact, his introduction to science was because of some hand-me-down chemistry sets by his elder cousin. So basically, I'm saying that it was not somebody who was, you know, brought up very, you know, mid, uh, very upper middle class family where education, people, science education was not a novelty. He was actually brought up in a family where uh, th things were not, uh, he, they were not very well off. But he went to a wonderful school, which is called the Bronx High School of Science. And the thing is that this school boasts of at least seven Nobel laureates in its alumni. I don't know if there are any more. And two of them are Steven Weinberg and Sheldon Glashow. Both of them were classmates in this school. And in addition to that, there were Melvin Schwartz, who discovered the muon neutrino, David Politzer, whose name I will mention later, who discovered the theory of strong interactions. Roy Glauber, who got the Nobel Prize for quantum optics, which is known to people in this institute uh, much better than me. So, in 1954, he graduated from Cornell University, and at least for me, this puts everything in the context, given the fact that I was born in 1952, and I'm sure that most of the members in the audience are born much after that. So, here is a man whose story we are telling. It's almost from a time gone far away back. So, 1957, he finished his PhD in Princeton, and then he was in Berkeley as a faculty after spending time in Columbia and Berkeley again. Uh, and then he became a faculty in Berkeley. In 1966, he actually moved to the East Coast, first to MIT and Boston University, and then to Harvard, uh, where he stayed for a lot of years till 1979. And he moved to Harvard because his wife wanted to pursue a degree in law. Now she's a law professor. At University of Texas in Austin, and what I found very endearing in one of the interviews that he gave, he said, "A lot of my thinking was done while sitting on the park benches and watching my daughter play because his wife was studying at Harvard at that time." So this particularly endeared him to me. I mean, he, he was a every every day map person that comes through these kind of statements. And as I said, in 1979, they moved, made a move to University of Texas at Austin. Where I think Professor Lewis still continues today to be a law professor. So, what was the situation in physics in 1960? In 1960, by 1960, in fact, uh, the particle physicists uh, had actually understood 
uh, and developed a particular framework which was started from Paul Dirac in fact, which is called quantum field theory. We do not need to understand what it is, but apart, apart from knowing that it was a framework which was constructed using the joint principles of special theory of relativity and quantum mechanics which were discovered in the, which were invented uh, in the, as we know, in the early parts of the 20th century. And this quantum field theoretic description of electromagnetic interaction was actually the first step in understanding all the fundamental interactions in terms of the exchange of a force carrier. Faraday and Maxwell and so on had un helped us understand interaction between two electro, for example, electric charges, stationary or moving in terms of fields. For example, we knew that if there is a charge Q1 here and a charge Q2 here, then the charge Q1 will produce field, electric field, this will be the field lines and the charge Q2 will then see that, see that field and then it can give rise to a potential energy between these two charges which is Q1, Q2 by R. But this development of the quantum field theoretic description which was completed in, by Feynman, Tomanaga and Schwinger who in fact got the Nobel Prize for that, they had actually shown that this description it is completely equivalent to another description where we say that this charge Q1 emits a photon that traverses the distance, some distance to the charge Q2 and that uh, uh, this carries this force and you can either understand this in the field language, action at a distance or you can understand it in terms of the exchange of a photon and you can actually derive starting from this picture and the principles of field theory, the potential which is given by Q1, Q2 by R. And that was what was known in 1960 and people had understood it and they were happy about it. But now having understood a way to explain the electromagnetic interactions in terms of this wonderful principles because quantum mechanics and theory of relativity are really basic fundamental principles. And by just using these fundamental principles if you are able to explain another fundamental phenomenon such as the electromagnetic uh, interactions between charged particles you kind of then say that okay the theoretical physics community felt that yes now the same framework it should be possible to use to explain other interactions that you see in nature. And by now we know there are two other interactions and I am sure all of you have heard these names so I will use those names. So these are the strong interactions and the weak interactions. But unfortunately description of these two interactions in terms of a field theory was completely impossible and they were conceptual problems, not just calculational problems. In the case of strong interactions, Gelman and Zweig actually had made some sense of the particle zoo in terms of what they call quark model, where they said that all the objects that we see are made up of protons and neutrons, are made up of quarks and antiquarks, and they had a model to describe all this. However, since no free quarks were seen, Nobody, actually very few people were believe, believers in quarks including Weinberg as I will tell you later and show you why, uh, how that was shown. And Yukawa's theory had actually qualitatively explained how the two protons or two neutrons are held together in a nucleus. But that was in terms of pion exchanges and they said aha it is exactly like the photon exchanges between two charges, maybe a pion is exchanged between a proton and a neutron and that is how they are held together. So that sounded like a great idea, but the strength of the coupling was so large that you could not do any computations. So in this case the ideas of field theory could not be used because you could not, uh, you could not do any computation and apart from that there was not one unique model, Yukawa's idea was one of the many ideas and one did not know there was no uniqueness about this theory. Then there was a story of weak interactions which are responsible for, for example, beta decay and uh, okay, I, I made a small mistake. Here I drew the diagram horizontally. It is the same diagram except that I have now drawn it vertically. So in, in that what happened was thanks to ECG Sudarshan and Marshak as well as Feynman and Gelman and, and Schwinger, some understanding of weak interactions had developed. And one had said that if there is a neutron which is decaying into a proton, electron and a neutrino, then it is, it can be looked upon as uh, being caused by the exchange of a weak boson or the W boson, this was the name given to it by Schwinger. But there was small difference between this diagram and uh, this diagram because the potential between two electromagnetic charges as we know the Coulomb law 
is q1 q2 by r it, one can feel it uh, up to infinite distances unless we have some screening of uh, the charge somehow whereas in this case the, the beta decays happened only inside a nucleus and the potential that was caused by this exchange of this w boson well, had to be a very short range and that had to be proportional to e to the minus mr by r this was a bit similar to yukawa's ideas of a massive exchange uh, exchanger. So, this is the point that the short range meant that this exchange particle had to be very heavy and the photon on the other hand as I said was zero mass. So, the theoretical ideas that worked very well for the description of electromagnetic interaction could not work for the weak interactions and if you try to make any predictions because of this mass of this uh, exchange particle the, the theoretical predictions made no sense at higher energies. So, it was a mess. So, in fact, there were a lot of people and very famous theoretical physicists who had started asking the question whether field theory at all is a good framework. Perhaps this is the wrong framework and we have to go back to a, a, a drawing board that was the feeling. And in fact, Weinberg says about this mess that, you know, his advice to young students is, my advice is to go for the messes. That is where the action is. So, he described the situation of particle physics in 1960 in these words. He says particle physics really was a mess in the 1960s. But since that time, the work of many theoretical and experimental physicists has been able to sort it out and put everything, oh, almost everything together in a beautiful theory known as the standard model. Another point I want to bring here actually, which I have written in brown here, uh, is to show that he was always very particular about assigning credit. So, here in spite of the fact that the man had in fact suggested the model and there was no you know conclusive evidence that he had suggested the model uh, and the complete model was uh, the first one to suggest it, it, it definitely understands and underscores the work of other theoretical and experimental particle physicists. Again, I like that as a scientist, this honesty and integrity is something that we can worth emulate. So, then he said that okay, he uh, says that go for the messes and then in order to continue using my oceanographic metaphor while you are swimming and not sinking, you should aim for rough waters. So, indeed he actually preached what he had practiced and he went for the messes and in fact his work produced order in the chaos for both these subjects and that is the beauty. I mean particle physics on the whole was in a total state of disarray. And this gentleman made very important contributions in each of the area and one of them is the formulating uh, of the formulation of effective field theory and the other is electroweak unification. So, that is why I said that electroweak unification was only part of his legacy. In fact, much more important part of his legacy, equally important part of his legacy is this formulation of effective field theories. And all this work was done in 1966 and 1967. In fact, I should also say that from 1957 to 1966, he did enormously important work of very technical nature, which has been very well recognized and uh, in particle physics. And he is a very well recognized authority to establish field theory as the correct framework. But that is not something that is part of our discussion at all. But all I hope by saying all these things is to tell you how many different things he contributed to in particle physics. This first work of first 10 years was purely technical. That would be of interest only to par, you know, people who are trying to practice the art. And these two are the broad brush pieces of work that he did. So, what he did for strong interactions? Problem with strong interactions as I told you was the strength of the coupling was too high and you cannot do perturbation. So, he said, okay, why do you do perturbation in coupling inter strength? Do not do, do not expand in uh, order of couplings, but expand in inverse powers of energy. So, that means that each term that you have in inverse powers of energy, the first term will con contain in the expansion all the terms in the coupling. So, he reorganized the series in some sense and then at the low energies, which is the nuclear physics energies. In fact, you could do make do only with the first term and uh, because the expansion in inverse powers of energy meant that uh, the lowest uh, term was enough at low energies. And in fact, what he showed 
is that the pi r nucleon cross section for example could be explained in terms of a parameter of 2 which were independently determined from the data. So, you took data determined two parameters of that model and then you were able to make predictions for all the experiments and he actually made very important new predictions and that was actually something extremely important. So, as I said it made very very good predictions. So, it was not just the description of making sense of what was happening. So, he said that this is he describes this work as that my style is to interpret in a broad way of what is going on and make very general remarks like the development of the point of view that is associated with effective field theory where you try to expand not in couplings but in energy. And then you say at low enough energies the higher terms which involve higher powers of energy since you are doing inverse powers of energy the first term in the expansion is all that there is and then life is very simple. So, that is what he did. Actually what happened was soon after he showed this particle physicists actually understood that uh, strong interactions can be described using quantum chromodynamics in terms of quarks and gluons. Politzer from the Bronx high school actually his classmate had the Nobel, got the Nobel prize for this work. But however, the framework that Weinberg then introduced for strong interactions has become remained effectively the only one to handle the strong interactions among objects which are composite that is pions and neutrons and protons, but it went much beyond that. It went beyond that and now the same ideas offer us a possible theoretical understanding why the neutrinos which are known to be incredibly light and which form the same spectrum along with the top quark which is incredibly heavy that there is about 12 orders of magnitude in the masses of the lightest neutrino and the top quark. So, why does that happen? In a very natural way his effective field theory actually gave uh, provided a framework which offered an explanation how the neutrinos can be so incredibly light, lighter than uh, EV electron volt and actually today this framework gets used even in condensed matter theory. Even more than that the standard model in spite of the great success that was celebrated in the discovery of the Higgs boson actually remains incomplete in many ways and many of the problems are not yet fully resolved in this framework. For example, dark matter, for example, matter antimatter asymmetry in the universe and this means that the physics beyond standard model interactions and particles which are outside the framework of the standard model must exist. But the Large Hadron Collider in the study for the last 10 years has not given any evidence for any of these particles. So, which means that these particles must lie at high energy just like the W boson in 1966 was lying at least 3 to 4 orders of magnitude above the energies that were available then. So, it is the same story and just like the theory of weak interaction was an effective theory now the effective field theory formalism that has been suggested by Weinberg is actually perhaps the best way to proceed now to make sense out of our current mess. So, therefore, the methods and ideas that he has invented are still the best tools for theoretical physics community even today after in the intermezzo of electroweak unification that I will tell you in the next few minutes uh, has now passed through. So, now I come to his work in 1967 on uh, unification of electromagnetic and weak interaction. So, there is a paper called a model of leptons. It is a three page paper. It is a paper in physical regulators and for particle physics community at least physical regulators remained the journal in which you published for a very very long time. I say this because depending on the area in which you work nature, nature physics, science are perhaps uh, very important publications for particle physics community mostly it has been physical regulators. So, it was a three page paper in physical regulators. And he called it a model of leptons. When asked later, he said that he did not believe that the quarks existed. Therefore, he did not include quarks in this description. It was only a model of leptons. And uh, I would tell you that as far as the leptons are concerned, not a line has to be changed in the paper from the paper if we have to put it in textbook. And in fact, in a textbook that I am writing or anybody who writes on standard model more or less reproduced the lines from his paper. And I think that is something really special that the paper is absolutely complete. 
And the basic message of this paper was that the electromagnetic and weak interactions are actually the same when the energies are very, very high with respect to the masses of the W and the Z bosons. And he showed that he actually, this part, the green part is something that both Glashow, Weinberg and Salam, all three of them had contributed to this. But Weinberg had an additional part. I mean, that's why it became a model of leptons because he was also able to show how the non-zero masses of leptons are also compatible with the symmetries. And this was actually the basis, this is actually the basis of the standard model. So this is the complete standard model. Weinberg's paper con contained the green and the brown material. And he used in that a result which was obtained by Peter Hicks and Angle and Braut. And that result was uh, very important which postulated the existence of the Higgs boson. That work was very important to make this formulation and this paper possible. In fact, along with Salam and Goldstone, he had written a very influential paper just before Peter Heath's paper. And there was a showing that saying that such a description uh, is not going to be possible. But Higgs found a loophole in their paper. And hence, he immediately appreciated the importance of Higgs's work and used that uh, paper to postulate, uh, to make this uh, assertion. So let me just read the first few lines of this uh, paper called a model of leptons. I don't even know how many times it has been cited. Some 40,000, 15,000 times. I mean, this is a matter of, uh, again, interest uh, for numerology. So just read these first few lines and you will realize that anybody can understand them. Leptons interacts only with photons and with the intermediate bosons that presumably mediate weak interactions. Mind you, this is 1967. We don't know for sure that weak bosons exist. So therefore, he goes with saying presumably mediate weak interactions. What could be more natural than to unite these spin 1 bosons, that is the photons, with the electroweak bosons into a multiplet of gauge fields. This is the only technical word. Standing in the way of this synthesis are the obvious difference in the masses of the photon and the intermediate meson, which I pointed out to you were understood on very general grounds and in their couplings. We might hope to understand these differences by imagining that the symmetries relating the weak and electromagnetic interaction are exact symmetries of the Lagrangian, but not of the vacuum. This is actually the content of the entire paper in the first few lines. And apart from this last few lines, I think everybody can understand everything else. And the essence was these last few lines. And that, and that this is the thing, however, this raises the specter of uh, unwanted massless Goldstone boson. This was the influential paper that Goldstone, Salam, and uh, Weinberg had written. And Higgs basically told them how to get rid of this specter. That was the point, OK? So now, did we ever hear such a unification earlier? In fact, such an unification was very well known in, you know, long back and this was achieved by these two giants, in fact. And uh, using Maxwell's equations, uh, one could actually see that the velocity of light C was predicted in terms of the electric and magnetic permeability of the vacuum. This is something you can easily derive, where epsilon naught mu naught are measured completely independent ways and then one can find that the velocity of light that you have measured separately actually is related to these two constants. So this equality is the prediction of unification of electricity and magnetic. So similarly, a unification of electric and magnetic, uh, weak and electromagnetic interaction, what did it predict? These are the predictions of the lepton model, A lepton model. It was the existence of a heavy counterpart of the photon which would mediate new weak interactions, the so-called neutral current interactions. Remember, in the Nobel citation, it said that they were give, being given the Nobel Prize for giving a unified description and inter alia, by the way, predicting weak, new, weak neutral currents. And indeed, these were discovered in 1974. Now, that is actually was enough, perhaps, for some people to think that they are right but in fact, what one more prediction was that the masses of this W and the Z bosons as well as the interactions of the leptons with the W and the Z were actually predicted in terms of the electron charge E and one parameter called Weinberg angle or the weak angle. 
So, in 1974, we discovered the neutral currents. By 1979, people had been able to, they, they still did not find the W and the Z bosons. However, they could check a relationship between the W and the Z boson masses in terms of the Weinberg uh, weak angle as well as the couplings. And this predictions of the theory were confirmed by experiments in 1979. So, in 1979, they got the Nobel Prize even if W and Z were not seen experimentally and they could not be seen experimentally at that time simply because not enough energy was available. And now today what we call the standard model is nothing but this A model of leptons extended to include the quarks and extended to include the strong interactions because quarks are strong interactions. And as I said this whole thing has kept the particle physics community busy for 60 to 70 years. Now what did Weinberg himself think about this theory or model? In an interview to CERN Courier on the occasion of his winning the breakthrough prize in fundamental physics, I do not remember the year, he said, it was this model was a rather untypical for me. My style usually not to propose specific models that will lead to specific experimental predictions. So that was not something that he really wanted to do. He always wanted to make sense of the big picture. But the interesting part was that he at this one point and I think thankfully for the particle physics community and theoretical physics in general, he did, uh, he did not build a model but he proposed one model and what a model it was, it went on to become a theory. So even if it is called a model, now we know that it is really the truth, it is not just modeling some truth. Oh, I do not know what has happened. Uh, okay. The last line I do not remember, we will see. So, he himself felt that the model had too many arbitrary features and the most arbitrary of them were the parameters corresponding to the masses and that was something that actually bothered him, continued to bother him. Yeah, uh, can people see this? No. Uh, all right, I, I was trying to see if I can see the last slide. So, he, in January 2020, that is a few months, this was the paper that I was referring to. He wrote a paper called model for quark and lepton masses. Uh, it is of, of course not a realistic model but an idea. So far the model, you know paper has not found many takers but his famous paper that I showed you model of leptons actually did not find any followers for about 5 years after the model was proposed. So maybe there is still hope but very realistically I think physics has moved far beyond and those ideas are most likely not very, uh, not likely to re lead any new path, but this is just a joke. Apart from you know, this unification, he continued and this was a dream that, you know, many people had shared beginning from Einstein and Weinberg contributed very importantly to this by writing a landmark paper with uh, Georgi, uh, Howard Georgi and Glashow, again the same Sheldon Glashow who got the Nobel Prize along with him for the theory of weak interactions. They proposed the idea of unification of electromagnetic weak and strong interactions. And that actually had a very important prediction and the prediction was that a proton should decay. We all know proton live forever, that is why we live forever. But he, he, he said that the proton will decay a very, very, on a very, very long, large time scale. And what will be the time scale of that lifetime uh, of the proton decay? They estimated that and this was the work done by Weinberg, Helen Quinn and uh, Howard Georgi. So these three people predicted the proton decay lifetime to be 10 to the 30 years again using measurements that were available at that time. So this is the hallmark of his uh, theoretical work that one was able to put forward a complicated theoretical structure but predict a very well defined quantity that can be measured and prove or disprove the idea. And in fact, this whole theoretical formulation made a prediction for the existence of particles with very, very large masses. What is meant by very large? I just want to tell you that this made the masses to give rise to the mass uh, lifetime of 10 to the 30 years, the kind of particles that would mediate that decay, the masses were of the order of 10 to the 16 G giga electron volts. To put into perspective, mass of a proton is 1 GeV approximately. Alright, 
So in the same time, he gave some lectures at the school, summer school at Branda University. And there he conjectured that these ideas of unification and the existence of very high mass particles, as well as the observation of CP violation in the particle physics experiments, said that maybe the particle physics ideas have some relevance to what happened in the early universe. And I think this was the third direction, important direction in which Weinberg start contributed. Because these ideas contained the seeds of an explanation of matter atom matter universe in the universe that we today uh, follow. And I would say that this whole area is a very, very active area of research and a very important part of a subject called astroparticle physics, where you unify or come very many different ideas from particle physics, cosmology and astrophysics come together. In the 60s, I think Weinberg was one of the few going along this path. He was following the likes of Bethe Gamma out here. And today, I think astroparticle physics is at the forefront of scientific explorations because even gravitational wave detection is a part of the same exploration and understanding and getting clues to cosmology through various neutrino cosmology, through uh, gravitational wave detection, ultra high energy neutrinos. This has become, you know, this has what brought all of us together. And the seeds of some of these ideas were sown in these early papers. And of course, his second uh, uh, quantum field theory was his, uh, you know, not sort of abiding fashion. And how to bring together gravity, quantum field theory was actually something that he was very passionate about. And in very early work, he actually gave a lot of clarity to the formulation of quantum field theory. And he proved, by the way, inter alia, he also proved that the spatial theory of relativity and quantum mechanics, just using these two concepts, which we know to be of fundamental importance, he showed that if there is a, in the universe a massless spin 2 particle, it will have to mediate gravitational interaction. I think this is a very fundamental uh, theorem that if to, we had found gravitational interactions, I mean, I mean the fact that if there, there is a massless spin 2 particle, it will have to be graviton. I think this is something very fundamental about what we are seeing and see, explaining what the universe is about. In fact, his interest in gravity then sort of, uh, I would say that this statement is something that opened up the doors for quantum gravities about which still very little is known. Then his interest in gravity also drove him to understand the subject of observational cosmology and his pursuit in cosmology yielded an understanding, I think a very important understanding of cosmological constant problem. As I said here, I am on very shaky grounds and there are experts in the audience who can tell you much more than what I know, but I will still give you a summary of what I understand. So the general theory of relativity in general allows possible existence of a constant in the equations which we call the cosmological constant lambda. And it has the units of energy per unit volume, so that it has dimensions of energy to the power 4 in the naturalized units. And observed units, you observed universe is flat and large that we know. And the energy density of our large and flat universe is also known to be small. This all comes from observations. I am not talking uh, here as uh, uh, predictions. And uh, observation is this, okay. But now you ask the question, can I, ex what are the classical predictions for this quantity uh, from the, uh, looking at the equations, what will a theorist predict? So classically actually a theorist will predict the observed value of lambda to be 10 to the 120 times this. So theorists are way, way off. Then if you say, okay, you are a quantum field theorist, you are a little bit smarter than the rest, people who do only classical gravity, you will, your prediction is still only 100 GeV to the power 4. And that is still, if you calculate the powers, it's still 10 to the 55 times bigger than the observation. So this is a huge problem. And if you are going, to, if you are going to be a theorist worth salt, any theorist worth his or her salt would not like this situation. So people were at their wits end and nobody knew why the cosmological constant is so small. And people had kind of said that this is due to something called the anthropic principle, that it is small, as small as it is, because otherwise we will not be here to ask this question, because if the uh, cosmological constant was very large, then the universe as we know, a flat and large universe 
would not have become possible. That was just a sort of an idea. But Weinberg was not very happy with such a qualitative answer. And he actually made a quantitative, made this answer more meaningful and more quantitative because he established what is called an anthropic criterion. And he actually tried to calculate this constant by demanding that it should allow formation of galaxies and hence our presence. So the, he they did use some of the observations and uh, cosmology and un understanding of the early cosmology. And with Shapiro and Martel, they actually predicted a value what the cosmological constant should be. And many years later, the observation of the expanding accelerating universe actually did tell us what is the major value of uh, cosmological constant. And that value now seems to be of the same order of magnitude as the mass density. So now, in fact, earlier the question was why is the cosmological constant so small? Now the question has been replaced and the question is why the observed density of the vacuum is matter density is the same as the observed matter density of the same order of magnitude. So that's the different question, we still don't know the answer. But I would like you to read the abstract of the anthropic bound on the cosmological constant by Weinberg. This was a paper he wrote in 1987 and please read this. In recent cosmological models, there is an anthropic upper bound on the cosmological constant lambda. It is argued that in the universe that do not recollapse, the only such bound on lambda is that it should not be so large as to prevent the formation of the gravitationally bound states. It turns out that the bound is quite large and the cosmological constant that is within one or two orders of magnitude of its upper bound would help with the missing mass and the age problems of the nuclear of the universe but may actually be ruled out by the galaxy number counts. Now what I am trying to show you here again is that he gave a solution. But he said the solution and the calculation I have done may actually be falsified. He predicted what measurements ought to be done to be able to test it, prove it or falsify, prove it wrong. And this I find a very, very attractive uh, uh, feature. And actually within two years, he wrote this uh, really authoritative review of modern physics. And I think most of the ideas uh, that, uh, were, that were around that time were discussed. And today actually people understand this to be a correct thing. So now I have finished as much as I could tell you about Weinberg and his physics. But I want to still tell you a few more things about his textbooks. He was a great and consummate teacher. And he actually has said this that as is natural for an academic, when I want to learn about something, I volunteer to teach a course on the subject. And in his long life, he taught many, many courses. And almost every time, it led to a book. His first important books were two volumes on quantum field theory. And there are generations of particle physics students, including yours truly, which grew up on these books. And his scholarly monograph on gravitation and cosmology, principles and applications for general theory of relativity, actually is a book which was published in 1972. And it is really the cross fertilization of the two disciplines of elementary particle physics and cosmology. And it is a book on cosmology that particle physicists like. It may not be a book that all the cosmologists like. But at least this is responsible for a whole lot of particle physicists, including again yours truly, to be in, get involved and, and try to gain an understanding of cosmology and gravitation. So many a generations of particle physicists trained on these three books, in fact. So from the preface of gravitation and cosmology, I will tell you why particle physics is like this book. So he said that I found that in Mach's textbooks, the geometric ideas were given a starring role. So that the student would come away with the impression that this had to do with space time being a Riemannian manifold and has nothing to do with something physical. That was his objection to the earlier description of gravitation. And he said the important thing is to be able to make predictions about the images on astronomers photographic plates. And it simply does not matter whether we ascribe these predictions to the physical effects of the gravitational field or curvature of space time. I mean, I like this attitude that finally the role of a physicist is to understand what we see in experiments. That is the most important aim for which and then through it understand the uh, secrets of nature. And I think it is this approach which attracted many of the particle physicists to the book and then to the field 
of uh, gravitation and cosmology his most compulsive need i would say of clarifying and elucidating then he penned a series of monographs and books on this subject i already mentioned the book on uh, gravitation and cosmology there was a sequel to it called cosmology and actually that was important because between the 272 to 2000 cosmology had moved in leaps and bounds and in fact what i found in this book which was amazing was he was trying to give analytic understanding of the phenomena occurring in the early universe by using the latest experimental data and try to abstract things in terms of few analytical expressions i think that is a master piece this particular book on cosmology i studied many things from this and i found it was a master piece but then he said okay he wanted to go down to more elementary things as we things we learn earlier such as quantum mechanics modern physics and i would say that his book on modern physics and his explanation of rutherford scattering i would advise all of you to take a peek at it it's beautiful in few lines he explains to you why rutherford experiment tells you that the size of a nucleus is much smaller than the size of an atom in very simple back of the envelope calculations that's simply amazing so that was the beautiful beauty of his books that they talk to the reader they did not give any great scholarly rubric and still you know they have lasting impact because they were accessible to the students great clarity but there was no compromise on rigor so every statement was perfectly correct you didn't really have to say oh here he is waving hands even when he waved hands the waving of the hands was very precise actually and i have actually all these books and i would say that these textbooks are the one of the very very important part of his legacy to the world of theoretical physics uh then he went on to popular writings his book on cosmology and gravitation is the one that actually led him to write the first popular science book the first three minutes in 1977 and many were to follow the discovery of subatomic particles and the dreams of a final theory are two are two which are very quite popular this is the latest one and this is the old one which had had given a lot of excite rise is a rise to an excitement and i would say that his touchstone for popular science was that the arguments must, must remain true to science and that is actually very rare to find in a popular book and i would advise you people the ones who have not looked at this uh, books to really take a look at it because it gives such a lucid understanding of very complex concepts of cosmology or for me because that was something i learned from this book and they still must remain accessible to an intelligent non scientist readers and people say that he tried it on his lawyer wife before he sent it to anybody else to read so i think it's important he said i think it's very important not to write down to the public you have to keep in mind that you are writing for people who may not be mathematically trained but are just as smart as you are so that is how he wrote his popular books he spent actually you know what was his advice to young scientists again that is directed at the back of the room he had spent one year in niels bohr institute on a fellowship before joining princeton uh, for uh, uh, doing his phd and he did his first piece of research in niels bohr institute and it was about theoretical issues with the lee model of strong interaction as a small aside i can tell you that as a graduate student i was made to work on the lambu lambu jona lasinio model which was actually proving that the lee model was wrong so from 1957 to 1974 in the 20 years strong interactions have moved that much more that they had replaced the lee model by lambu jona lasinio model this is to describe to you the bad situation in strong interaction theory in 1970s and 60s so it was this experience that was behind his advice to young people which he gave much later at the graduation address at mcgill university you don't have to know everything because i didn't when i got my phd so don't wait to start your research till you have studied everything because otherwise you will never start that was his uh, advice and then he said that the young people should learn things on the job as it were as goes one goes along working on the subject and developing the grand picture and there he used this swimmer analogy often that i have already mentioned he wrote again extensively on science history of science science and religion 
Many of these have been published as articles and books. Actually, I think this is thing I would really like us to know, and I think in today's environment and atmosphere, this is very important. So I want to stress on that. He was aware of the dangers of rising anti-science sentiment from religious, political, and philosophical norms. So in a talk at the graduation ceremony, which I already told you, he called upon the student at this college to be, become his allies in a movement which he called the Enlightenment. Because he said, the ethos of the age of enlightenment has made the world a freer and a gentler place and urged them to guard against the dilution of its values. And what he means by enlightenment is the time from Newton's Principia. That is where science started. Science as we know as a physicist, many of us think that it started with Newton, who start, uh, gave us the pathway to how we understand the secrets of the universe. And starting from there, there has been this journey. And we as scientists need to be uh, aware and uh, carry this torch uh, farther, further. That was his idea. Then he said something else, which I liked again. As you will learn from the rich history of science, you will come to see how time and again, from Galileo through Newton and Darwin to Einstein, science has weakened the hold of religious dogmatism. And I think we need to remember this. Science plays a very important role in our lives, other than making us understand the secrets of nature. He told Graham Farmelo in an interview, which again I liked very much, and this is for a theorist. I could only be happy as a theorist if experiments were giving me regular food feedback from nature about my speculations. And to me, this is really, you know, exemplifies what drove his scientific pursuits. But he was actually at the same time fully supporters of supportive of practitioners of string theory. He believed that we might be in for a long haul or for a change of param paradigm, but we need to follow this to its logical conclusions. That is what he said in his book on dreams of a final theory. And this book actually takes us to the future and tries to say the promise of super string theory at the term of 21st century. Unfortunately, that promise has not been fulfilled, which he wrote in his book. But he agreed later on in an interview that the future that he had predicted seems much farther away than we had hoped it to be. But an interesting point he makes is if the promise of the string theory as a final theory is borne out, he didn't think it was the final theory, then the endeavor of physics as a mathematical philosophy of nature started by Newton will have been finished. But since we have not yet proved string theory to be the theory of everything, I guess the process of uh, the endeavor of physics still continues and there is still a lot of work to do for all of us. So summary, I, there are many other personal uh, anecdotes that are mentioned in the, our obituaries and these are essentially from the personal experiences of uh, my friend uh, Ujit Yarnik who was his uh, student at the University of Austin uh, at Texas. I hope you would agree with me that his was a life of science lived with the single-minded pursuits about the truths of nature. He had said in interviews that science strives to understand why things are the way they are. And then in his first three minutes, he puts very eloquently, and I want to read that. He said, the effort to understand the universe is one of the very few things that fills, lifts human life a little above the level of a farce and gives it some of the grace of a tragedy. And I think he did this for a lot of us. In fact, I think he did for all of us scientists who strive to understand the secrets of nature and secrets of universe. And I think the best honor and best uh, sort of, how should I say, best tribute we can pay him is to continue honestly full of integrity in our pursuits. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a good bullet again for the wonderful, lucid and inspiring talk and bringing out the essence of uh, one world's vision. I should um, like to add uh, one book in the list of books that you mentioned. Ah, I forgot. Lecture notes on astrophysics, which came out a few years ago. No, I do have that book. I forgot. It was a no, no, I forgot to add that book. I have that book. 
<laughs> because that's where I learned my I learned my astrophysics from that book and the other tribute is from Padmanabhan's book. So it's a stamp of a master like I I have read I have learned my astrophysics from these two books. Yes. Thanks for pointing it out. <laughs> Questions? Yes, <laughs> so that was a really great account of a whole bunch of physics which happened and the people and particularly um, uh, Weinman's uh, take on how he approached science. I want to ask you a, perhaps a provocative question in this respect. What is? <laughs> <laughs> which is that increasingly there is a certain a view among um, certain parts of the community, particularly championed by string theory, uh, that science or the theory need not be falsifiable for it to be a part of scientific framework. Um, I mean, that actually goes quite against the Weinman Wein ethos that you have been talking about. But I would like to hear your comments uh, on this particular aspect, because it is it strikes at the foundation of scientific method and scientific practice. No, I agree with you. I mean, I understand the question. I thought that was one reason why I went out of my way to point out, even for something, I mean, as abstract as the uh, anthropic uh, criterion or anthropic principle, Weinberg himself was so careful in writing in the abstract. So I think I, you can call it a little, but I don't know the rest of the community, but I am a part of a somewhat older science particle physics community, which, which saw string theory only as an emerging uh, thing and field theory was our God. So <laughs> for me, I think fal falsifiability in any form is an important part, according to me, of putting forward a theory. Now, the whole point is that it need not be falsifiability at that point in terms of some experimental observations. But what is important is the consistency. I mean, why did, for example, Fermi's theory, which at that time was working beautifully, why did we still say that this is not a complete theory? We said it is not a complete theory because it, it had inherent, it was full of contradictions. So I would like to say that a theory which is consistent within itself is something that one has a right to put forward and say that right now the experimental tests are not possible. But you have to be able to, how should I say, you have to be able to charter out the path which will somehow either in principle, in terms of logic, what will test its, uh, test the foundations of the theory. This is what I feel. Uh, can I just add a little bit? So actually, this particular thing is not new and is not at string theory's door. It is, it rests with the Copenhagen interpretation itself, which by its construction, is not falsifiable, and this has been beautifully argued by David Bohm in yes, sir. his efforts to kind of critique quantum theory. And okay, so the question is really, I mean, I mean, it, what's the 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 present dialogue about falsifiability of theory? Actually, it seems rooted in the precedent of uh, Copenhagen interpretation. No, I would like to slightly differ with you, Sadiq. Huh? Because particularly, I mean, not just in Copenhagen interpretation, but in discussions of quantum mechanics. I mean, I would like to actually say that people who did not accept this hypothesis or this premise and continued to continue their quantum mechanics, their explorations in quantum mechanics have been now responsible for many of the new developments which we are seeing. You know, all the quantum, all the quant things quantum that are now becoming a big uh, thing. So in fact, I would say that this actually proves that one has to continue asking questions. And that's why I said questions of principle, 
about a theory, a theory's falsifiability. And right now, I mean, this happened in quantum mechanics, I agree with you, and this was a famous dialogue. But now we know that people who continued not believing in that actually made tremendous strides in theoretical uh, understanding. So I would actually say that even, even for string theory, I see now even I'm, it's, as a string theory, I'm actually a kind of a big supporter of the ideas of string theory, not because it will give us the final theory, but because it's beginning to make us understand why field theories work. So to me, it's a theoretical construction which goes beyond field theory. And quantum mechanics, quantum field theory have been sort of the steps of the same mechanics, right? Classical mechanics, quantum mechanics, uh, classical field theory and quantum field theory. And to me, string theories are now coming at a stage where they are beginning to make us and help us understand how field theories with strong interactions might work. And to me as a theoretical physicist, that is a big step forward. And to my mind, people who used to think that this is a theory of everything has indeed retreated as time has gone along. And that's why I added that last line that in theory, uh, in his dreams of a final theory, he had added this statement and I think it was a very prophetic statement that if indeed this was theory of everything, then the business of science was over. Because the business of science as we understand it is to uh, uh, explain, observe things in terms of a framework and make predictions also. And those predictions can be predictions in my mind of uh, simply technical uh, nature, uh, not something that you experimentally measure, but they can and, and technology is moving in directions. I mean, again, taking back the example of quantum mechanics, if the technology hadn't developed to the level at which it has developed, we wouldn't have been able to make and understand the statements about uh, entanglement and what have you that are now possible. So I think, you know, it's a continue, it's a progress of science and Copenhagen interpretation was one step in quantum mechanics. Similarly, the dreams of a final theory was one step. And I think we have passed, in my mind, dreams of final theory are just those, they are dreams. But on the other hand, the theoretical developments are not to be looked down upon because they are giving this fantastic methodology, the technology to understand the complicated bits of field theory, which were swept under the rug in the case of, uh, by renormalization, by the likes of Dow, uh, Dyson and Schwinger. Maybe we will begin to understand some of the, how would say, secrets of field theory through these methods. So I, I think, I mean, for example, the important thing is unitarity, okay? I mean, unitarity is one principle, just like quantum mechanics, you cannot uh, object to it. I mean, unitarity has to be true. Now, what we are finding using string theory methods that just the demands of unitarity is giving rise to the string uh, field uh, amplitudes that we calculate in field theory. So there is something there, there is some understanding of nature the mathematical underpinnings of this uh, vast enterprise that has been built since Newton. I think it's worth it. But I hope I have given enough of my uh, outlook. So I think it's an important exercise, but uh, it's not the story of the, the end of the story. So what is that work on? As I said, this was a work on trying to give a model for uh, quarks and uh, leptons. So he tried to give a framework, uh, how uh, basically these are the ideas of trying to explain the mass in terms of condensate of some fundamental constituents. So it was essentially based on those kinds of ideas. But as I said, those ideas are severely under pressure from the various precision measurements at the current uh, colliders. And it could be that the scale of confinement that he talks about is way above the scales that are accessible in energy, we don't know. But I don't think that that particular direction was particularly new. But it, what I found interesting is that even in January 2020, he was uploading a paper like a young graduate student would upload. I mean, that he still felt he had something to communicate and it was communicated, you know. So. 
I personally take huge inspiration from that. That, you know, I mean, suppose for somebody who had achieved all this in his illustrious career, he was still teaching his freshman course and he was still writing his uh, uh, paper on the archive and he was still writing at the same time an undergraduate textbook. I mean, this is what we should, if we can, I mean, I think if I can ever even aim to have 1000 of that, I would be, you know, I would say that I would have achieved a lot. And I think it's true for all of us. He was a one of a kind. I mean, I, I really felt that I wanted to convey this, you know, yes, he was a Nobel Prize winner. Yes, he did this. Yes, he did this. But he goes and becomes much beyond a Nobel Prize winner. That was the, actually the beauty of his uh, person and his contribution to science and to life in general. I mean, he spent time trying to convince the American government to give uh, sanction to the what was then called the superconducting super collider. He spent a lot of, he spent something like four or five years of his life in trying to promote that. Uh, obviously, he didn't succeed. And actually, it was in Texas partly because of his advocacy. Then I remember one of the big public talks he gave at one of the conferences I was present. Uh, I think this was in uh, Dallas. The conference was in Dallas. And he came and talked about the need and the aims of a next generation electron positron colliders. And the, you know, it was well informed, well articulated. So really Weinberg is an advocate of science, advocate of big science, small science, you know, I think, and the scientific methodology is something that we can take forward in our general understanding of how science should be pursued and practiced. What was the secret of the Bronx High School that it produced so many brilliant? <laughs> actually, he writes that in an interview, which is very interesting. He said that it wasn't as, I, actually, I used to have a slide, but I removed it. He, because I found that very interesting. He said that it wasn't as though that the teachers were great. But they left us alone. And they in fact had a, I wanted to say this, it was quite amusing. They said they had a group, they had a club. And this club used to meet every Sunday and discuss things. Put problems to each other and learn things that were not taught in school. So before they graduated from the Bronx High School, all of them had learned calculus, which was not taught in the school. And which when they entered, uh, entered, uh, where, you know, for their, after the high school, when they entered Cornell uh, University, they were much better uh, placed to understand the mathematics. The group, they trained themselves in group theory, in calculus. He actually mentions the specific uh, uh, topics even. So it was, I think it was just a bunch of extremely brilliant students. And this is something I myself uh, kind of believe that we learn a lot more from our peer, you know, from our peers than we learn from classroom teaching or, you know, discussions. I, at least I think that uh, people in front of whom you don't mind saying, I don't understand this. That is the crowd where you learn most because you, you and, and the persons to whom you can say, oh, you're talking through your hat. This is nonsense. And that you can do with your peers. I think that is the, so we can try to bring it up to our higher level also and I think it helps. I mean, personally, I collaborate best with people whom I can say that what you're talking is nonsense. If I feel free enough to say this to a collaborator, I think I can talk my, I can give my thoughts also, which might be completely stupid. And that has to be that freedom. And I think the school really describes in his words that kind of uh, atmosphere. Also, you have to realize, you know, the background of the Bronx School, almost, I mean, now I can say that I hope I'm not being recorded anymore because I will say something that is politically not correct. <laughs> no, no, these are all immigrants from Europe at that time. And Bronx is the area where essentially all the uh, Jewish uh, population lived actually. So these were people who had come to a new country where education was one way in which they could make a new life. This way, you know, I think that serves as an important, uh, uh, you know, 
trigger, right? Thoda, you get some extra nudge. So I think that was also part of this Bronx High School. I'm not sure how the Bronx High School works today. <laughs> But that was an interesting tidbit. I mean, seven, yeah. seven Nobel laureate and baby counting. I don't know. Oh, I get something. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you.